<clears throat> okay, so we have mostly talked about, uh, you know, so far talked about uh, generation, and we have talked about different mechanism, you know, uh, we have talked about absorption coefficient, we have talked about light trapping, each of them is supposed to maximize the generation. But we have to always, you know, bear in mind this inverse uh, process of uh, recombination. And today I want to dwell on it uh, a little more. I want to dwell uh, what are the different possible mechanisms and, you know, which one dominates in which kind of thing, okay? So, we talked about uh, previously when I was describing the, uh, I think the TJ Yablonovich limit or we, when we were talking about shockley quasi limit, I mentioned that there are different recombination mechanisms that can occur. So there is uh, uh, the obvious band-to-band uh, -band recombination, which is uh, which is leads to a generation of a photon, and this is uh, you know this is inherent to the cell. Anything which has to absorb light by the principle of black body radiation, it also has to emit light. So this process uh, has to occur. So this is one of the recombination mechanism. The other recombination mechanism is uh, this uh, recombination mechanism, which happens uh, with the help of traps. So you have this electron here, and you have a hole. And they can recombine using this uh, trap level, where this electron goes into the trap, and then essentially it, uh, it recombines with the hole. Or this hole can go into that trap level as well. And this is determined by, uh, this is many times called the shockley reed hall recombination, because the uh, the statistics of this, or the formula for this, or defining this, was given by uh, these three people, Shark, Siri, Han. And then uh, we talked about this third uh, recombination mechanism. And uh, this was when you have this electron and hole recombining, but instead of giving that energy out in the form of a photon, they give it to this other particle. So they give it to this other electron, and that rises up in energy but it eventually loses that energy when it thermalizes. Similarly, they can either give that energy to an electron, they can also give it to a hole, which again thermalizes and loses that energy. So this is the Auger recombination, right? So let me ask, you know, what do you think limits, which is the limiting mechanism for, uh, uh, for solar cells among all these three? Shakti Rira. Huh? Well, how many people think band to band? Okay, one person. You have, you know, you have like uh, more. You want to narrow your answer? You think like in yeah. some materials this might be more important than others? Yeah, and also uh, I would say like depending on what the solar is, Okay, so Ben is saying that band-to-band uh, -band might be more relevant if you have, uh, uh, so one might dominate if you have direct band gap material, let's say gallium arsenide, right? And he's saying three might dominate if you have a high concentration, right? Let's say you're operating at R&A. Okay. Uh, Phonon, the you know, usually never need. <laughs> I don't know why somebody would want to generate more phonon unless you want to generate heat in the system. Yeah. So in indirect band gap material, the this direct recombination is uh, the rate of that is lower. So usually recombination occurs via traps, which require the presence of phonon. But I, I don't know why you would generate. Uh, yeah, phonon generation is a, and by the way, it does not generate phonon. It just uses one of these phonons to you know cause this recombination. How about this side of the room? What do you guys? Nobody is going for number two. 
success. So JP is saying that number two, given that you have a bad uh, facility, or let me put it another one, if you have more traps, I know you have. Okay. So what do you think limits it in silicon? Let's, let's talk about your silicon, the dominant material for photovoltaics. More than 85% cells are made in silicon. So what do you think is the dominant, mecha dominant mechanism in silicon? Two. Okay, so let's you know let's examine this. How many people think two? Two, three, four, seven. And then how many people think three? One, two. And you think one? You're, you're, you're. Okay. <laughs> so actually, let's see. I mean, it's it's actually depends. So so. One thing I need uh, to introduce is uh, this recombination generation lifetime. So many a time you define your rate of generation recombination, and you say it's proportional to the access number of carriers I have, and then there's a generation recombination time, and this gives me my rate of recombination. So I can express my generation recombination time as essentially my excess carrier divided by the rate. This is not a universal definition, you know, so this is not always the case. And your your rate of recombination can, in many cases, not be directly proportional to your excess carrier density. It could be proportional to the square of it. It could be proportional to the square root of it. But usually, you know, in most of the cases, when you are operating near equilibrium, or you know, you are operating at low injection, when you haven't moved away that far from equilibrium, this is usually the case. And uh, people are used to expressing this. Uh, uh, recombination generation in form of this uh, recombination generation lifetime, okay? And uh, you people, you'll see, you know, think uh, like mention like, for example, you did the remember problem set to you used uh, a PC1D and you entered like a rate of uh, you know recombination time, right? So people are used to thinking of expressing this rate of recombination linearly and using one time constant. Typically, for each of these processes, for example, for radiative recombination, for OJ, for uh, shockley reed hall you have this individual formula which gives you the rate of recombination. And I'm, I'm, my purpose here is not to scare you with this formula, but you have these individual formula which are a function of the excess number of carriers you have. They are sometimes function of the doping. You know, so. It's a, it's a complex set of uh, equations which define this rate of recombination. But you always bunch them together into a single formula. So you say, you know, these I have these individual processes, you have this radiative recombination, OJ, Shockley, Reed Hall. But the rate of, of each of them happening, you know, I can assume that each of them will happen independently of each other. And uh, so I can add the total rate, or I can essentially express the total lifetime by adding them in this uh, geometric mean kind of a fashion, okay? So let's see, you know, let's now examine your claims, okay? So this is the actual data for a p-type uh, silicon. So you see the, I've split, uh, I've demonstrated the overall uh, lifetime by this red curve, but I've also given you the individual, uh, individual uh, uh, lifetime, so you can see that at lower carrier concentration. So if I look at lower carrier concentration, is the shockley reed hall uh, recombination which is limiting my uh, overall recombination time. But as Ben correctly mentioned, that if I go to higher carrier concentration, let's say I use uh, uh, I use let's say 100x concentration or 500x concentration on my silicon cell. So I'll generate a lot of these carriers, right? And when you have a lot of these carriers, your OJ process becomes uh, more, uh, uh, more. the rate of that increases, because OJ requires the presence of three carriers, right? It requires the electron and two holes, or it requires two electrons and one hole, because it needs to give that energy to another carrier. So whenever you have a lot of carriers, then your OJ recombination dominates, okay? So, when you're operating under, say, uh, uh, you know, one sun, con uh, one sun kind of a concentration, most probably if you're using silicon, it would be li limited by short field now. But if you go to higher concentration, especially these multi-junction cells, which are, uh, uh, you know, operating at higher concentrations, 
So in those, these OJ and the radiator, they compete uh, among these each other. So again, this is for uh, silicon, but if I was, uh, for example, using a direct band gap material, then this rate of radiative recombination would have been much higher. And this would be what would, you know, so this curve would come down and maybe now it can limit my overall lifetime. And that does happen in uh, most of the direct band gap material. So most of the direct band gap material, it's uh, these radiative, if it's at lower combination, lower concentration, and then it's a combination of radiative and OJ if it's at higher, higher concentration. So this is again another experimental curve. So you see that Shakti Reed Hall, and then in this case, it's plotting as a function of doping density. So even when I go to higher doping density, then my OJ becomes uh, a dominant force. And uh, you see that uh, my overall uh, lifetime is limited by this uh, OJ. Uh, radiative typically is, uh, is not that important for silicon, but it is very important for direct band gap material, such as uh, kelium arsenide or even uh, all the cell view materials you use in our multi junction cell. <clears throat> so now the interesting question is how do I measure these uh, measure these lifetimes? Okay, so uh, there's quite a you know there's a couple of methods I can use. One is that uh, you know maybe I excite a pulse, maybe you know I cause the excitation like this, and then I see how it decays as a function of time. So let's say over you know over. Over a period of time, it decays over, and I measure uh, that photoconductive decay. The other one is, you know, I shine a steady, st steady source of light, and I see how much excess carrier I've generated. And I can see, you know, my delta excess number of carrier is proportional to the generation rate times uh, overall uh, lifetime, and that's one way I can measure this lifetime. So. Let me show you one uh, actual piece of instrumentation which is used to measure this lifetime. And it's uh, uh, the company which sells it uh, is called the Sinton, um, Sinton uh, uh, Instrument. It's actually there's a background story behind it. It started by this person, Ronald uh, Sinton, who was uh, a student here at Stanford. And he was uh, one of the students of uh, uh, Dick Swanson and together if you read their papers they published the uh, first back contact cell also one of the first back contact cells which had the highest efficiency then he developed this in Sun Power but you know, suddenly he had some he wanted to start a company of his own so he started this uh, other company which of course has his name in it so he uh, it's always fun to start companies and you know, put your name <laughs> so it uh, measures this uh, um, and I have met him in conference, and he's always like, you know, he, like this instrument it uses like the most simplest of equations for career lifetime, and you know, these equations you learn in a course like 216, and it uses that to you know measure lifetime. So the way it uh, it you works is uh, uh, it uses uh, this uh, technique, which is a, a quasi steady. Uh, uh, state uh, photocurrent technique and uh, what that means is that uh, essentially you shine light and uh, you measure uh, you measure uh, uh, how that decays as a function of time and then you shine, shine light with a different uh, in intensity and uh, you measure the conductivity and this is measured usually using eddy current so there's a sensor for measuring uh, eddy currents which measures the conductivity uh, and uh, you measure the intensity of the light and you keep on changing that. So you measure this conductivity and uh, you fit, you use some numbers for mobility and you extract the excess number of carriers you have. So essentially you are able to use that to generate this kind of a plot where you can uh, uh, measure the lifetime at different uh, density. Since you are changing the intensity of the light, you are changing your carrier density, you are changing the amount of generated carrier so you can generate this uh, plot and you can see in which uh, which regions which uh, which recombination mechanisms are dominating so this is the bread and butter you know any solar uh, research group which is or any solar company which is uh, worth its weight and fast using these kind of measurements to determine what is the uh, what is the overall uh, recombination time or what is the overall lifetime uh, in their wafer 
so now we have talked about uh, mechanisms uh, which 